to just send your love, send your sustenance, send your peace in these people's lives. For Shirley in the hospital, for all that she's gone through in the last couple of days. We just want to lift her up and just pray that what the doctors need to find, they can find. For Hazel and the procedure that she's had in surgery and how she's trying to recover, we just want to lift her up to you. Others, Lord, that we'll be working in their homes on Saturday. We just pray that we'll be a witness. We'll be a light. We'll show love of the gospel. And we just lift them up to you, whether that be the Martins or whether that be uh, Tammy Matthews and, and the others that are dealing with cancer. We thank you, Lord, for the progress of David and others, some that are even here tonight. We just say hallelujah for that. For, and uh, we thank you for them, for Miss Sybil. And, and all those that just passionately want to follow you and are struggling with some issues in their life, we lift them up to you in the name of Jesus. And we pray that you will be there with them, that you will be by their side, and that you will also be a great healer to them. We thank you for hearing these prayers tonight. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. There are others that I didn't mention. The list is uh, long, but know that if you're on the list, we are praying for you. And I sent out some texts today to some of those people that we're praying for. And it's a joy, even uh, yesterday, getting to, to hear from some that are at home, still kind of stuck during this time. But they're able to praise the Lord, and God can use them as prayer warriors as they are away. And so there are other prayer requests that we want to continue to remember. But tonight, as we... Go into the book of Ezekiel, and we also be in the book of Hebrews as we look at two of those. I couldn't get out of chapters 30 through 32 and jump into 33. It's a total change, and, and hopefully we'll be there next week. But there was still one message that kept jumping out at me from these passages because we didn't take them very slowly, but we looked at them kind of an overview and so as I look at chapter 30 through 32, and we looked at Egypt, we mentioned last week at, at the end that there were seven oracles that God revealed to Ezekiel. And those oracles talked about God's wrath upon the nations, not only Egypt, but several other nations that were around Israel. Egypt was the primary nation. Egypt was the one that was still kind of a thorn in their flesh. Egypt was the one that many times they would look back to and they remembered the gods. They remembered the food. They remembered the fertile land. And even when they were wandering in the wilderness and then years later when they had their own place, such as the time of Ezekiel, they would look back to the times that they were in Egypt. Egypt was like a crutch. Egypt was one that God wanted to take away and take away the desire for the dependence on an earthly kingdom so that his people could focus on him, his heavenly kingdom. That's who he wanted them to focus on, him, not something of the earth. You may remember the line from the book of Genesis where Moses and Aaron are crying out to Pharaoh and they say this, let my people go. Very familiar line. And the bondage that they had at that time was not only uh, to Egypt, but, only, but also to the sinful and godless ways that the Egyptians had been teaching them in. And it's something that I think we can look at and we can learn from. As you look at the Bible, not only in the book of Genesis, but down through the ages, we as humans, not just the people of Israel, but Probably, if you admit it, each and every one of us as humans, even we who are Christians and have begun to follow God, we too, many times, will return to our vices. We return to our habits and we return and look back or sometimes even longingly on our sinful ways. And so it's that desire that God has for us to focus on him and focus on returning to, to the Lord and not returning to those evil ways and those evil I, idols and those evil parts of our lives. And when we are in Christ, he's given us a new life. The Bible says that we are new creations. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But even Paul himself talked about this wrestle with doing the things he didn't want to do and he would sometimes do them. And so we struggle with that as humans. And we give our lives over to Christ and when we do, he frees us 
from the clutches of sin. He frees us from this being able to go to, to, to hell from this promise of, of eternal life and eternal damnation. And he gives us everlasting life. We no longer have everlasting punishment. We have everlasting life. And that's the way we need to live. We need to live towards him. But unfortunately, we are not unlike the Egyptian people. And even though we may be Christians and we may live in a Christian country and we're constantly challenged with the question, is it really God that we are trusting? Are we trusting in other things? There are so many temptations out there. So many other things that we can focus on. So many things that we give our attention to or we give our time to. We put our trust in. And yes, there are many things that at times we even worship, whether we admit it or not. You know, I talked to a guy in town today as I was waiting for one of my tires to be replaced. And I began talking to him in his native tongue in Spanish. And we began to converse a little bit. And I was thankful he was talking slow. <laughs> because I haven't had a lot of practice lately. But he asked me what my work was. And I told him that I was a pastor. And then he asked me what denomination. And, and I told him that. And, and I said, but it's Christ first. Christ is first above any denomination. And then we began to talk about the coming of Christ. And he says, Christ is coming back. He's coming back. And I said, that's right. The, the Bible even talks about it as birth pains. And we see that in the, the lives around us. And he said, we need to be ready. We need to ask Christ, you know, to, to, to return and to be ready. And as I talked to him about Jesus' return and how we need to focus on that. And we don't need to look back. I said, we don't need to look back at our sinful life. Look back at those sinful ways. We need to look forward to him. And not look back at those things that we've repented from and the habits that we said we wouldn't take up again. You know, for this time, it took a war. It took many deaths. But God was intent on taking Egypt away from his children. That desire, that crutch, he no longer wanted his children to look back towards Egypt. Don't look back, he was saying. Don't look back at the godless people that, that held you as slaves and made you focus your attention away from me. Don't look back, God was saying, at the sinful desires that you had when you were there. All of that is crumbling. All of that is falling away. And he begins to mention some of the names, but there in the scriptures of Ezekiel chapter 32, he says, I will shatter this is around verse 12. I will shatter the pride of Egypt and all their hordes will be overthrown. Verse 15, Egypt will be desolate and I will strip the land and everything that is in it. He will be, they will be stripped, taken away, their pride taken away, their land taken away, their fertile ground gone. They will then chant out, he says, and lament. And there are many other nations around them. And he begins to name off some of these nations like Assyria and Elam and Edom. And then he mentions Pharaoh again and all of his army. And all those hordes will be killed by the sword. And he says several times in the scripture, when all this happens, when these crutches are taken away, when these gods, so to speak, are taken away, when this way of life is gone and they no longer can look towards Egypt, back towards Egypt, then they will know that I am the Lord, their God. God was saying, all this is going to fall down. All of it. And it's going to be evident. Don't look back. Don't hold on to the old ways. Don't hold on to your old security. Don't hold on to all of this that is crumbling and being destroyed. And I wonder that even across our nation at times. We've had some tough stuff lately, right? Birth pains. People talk about weather in all these different ways and what we can do about it as man. And I think we need to take care of our nation. We need to take care of our water and we don't need to pollute things. And I can't stand it when people throw trash on the ground. But ultimately, where the weather is concerned, God's in control of that. And he even says there will be wars and rumors of wars and there will be earthquakes and there will be all these pestilence and all these things. Jesus himself names them, a whole list of them. And he says, and that, are, that is signs that the end will come. We are during those times. 
waiting for the end to come. And as it become more and more, whether it be an earthquake, whether it be these hurricanes, whether it be fires destroying things, it's causing us as humans to kind of look around and not have dependence on so many earthly things and know that there is a God who is over the earth. And there are many that are blinded. But I hope those that aren't blinded see that we need to keep our eyes on him during this time. Don't look back at those old ways. Look forward. You know, this is a principle that is not new to Ezekiel. It was something that was in the Old Testament as well. Earlier in years, this principle was taught in the time of Abraham. Abraham was crying out to God and God was saying, I'm going to come and I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But Abraham said, my nephew Lot is there. And and there's this whole discourse around Genesis 18 on into 19 where he and God are talking about it. And God finally says, I'm bringing it. And so God is so displeased with the people inside. And he's more, you know, displeased with them in such a way that he's going to destroy that, that and those two cities. And so as, God, as Abraham is praying, he decides to do what God does. He sends two angels to rescue Lot and his family out of that place. It says when they rose the next morning, because they got there in the evening of the night, and they were telling them, we're, we're getting out of here the next day. When they rose the next morning... And they told Lot and his family to run, the, run to the hills in order to save themselves. They were told something very important. As you run to the hills, don't look back. Very clear. Very direct. Don't do it. How many times have we been told don't do something and we do it and many times we suffer the consequences. And now through the ages we have seen how Lot's wife looked back. Take your sons and daughters, whoever you have. He says, get out of this place because we're destroying it and you will be consumed in the punishment if you stay here. He even took hold of their hands, the scripture says, and they began to run with them. And he says, escape for your life. Don't look back. Very clear escape. Run to the mountains or you'll be destroyed. Don't stay in this flat plain area, he says. And then the, as you read the scripture, says the Lord began to rain fire down on those city, cities and upon the inhabitants of the cities. But what happened? Lot's wife looked back. Don't look back. That old sinful way. Don't, and it wasn't just that she looked back. Because I believe that God knew her heart. I believe that it wasn't just a thing of disobedience. But that she looked longingly back. She turned back to, to that which she wanted more than what she wanted to, to run to. And that was where God was taking her into a new era. A new time. And we see that. Now, many years later, because when she looked back, the scripture says she was turned to a pillar of salt. Her life was taken from her immediately. And I tell this not just to to her. I say this to all of us. You know, almost as I knock myself in the head. Hello, don't look back. There are things that God doesn't want us to look back at. Previous parts of our life. Previous habits, previous things that we should turn completely away from and never look longingly back at them. They're nothing but destruction. They're nothing but something that will take us down that path that could possibly destroy us or destroy our witness. Now in Ezekiel, he was saying the same type of thing. He says, I'm going to destroy your crutch. I'm going to destroy Egypt. Don't even look back. Don't hold on to that old way, that old security. You know, and that's a lesson that we can learn today. If the Lord has saved you, if he's redeemed you, if he's taken you out of a sinful lifestyle or he's taken a, a sinful habit away from you or something like that, don't look back toward it, to it. Go forward. Follow him where? Into the future. Follow him where he's leading you. Wherever he leads I'll go. That's a song I used to sing all the time as as a kid. And we've sang it some recently in years. Wherever he leads, I'll go. It's It's a message we need to remember, even when we're going through temptation. And that's where the book of Hebrews comes in. As we've tied in Ezekiel to Hebrews several times through this study, 
That's where I thought it was very interesting as we've been reading. And and I've read parts of chapter 3 before, but I look back at it because it says there in verse 12, Brothers, if there is any of you that has an evil heart, a heart of unbelief, a heart that wants to depart from the living God. See, that's that's kind of like the heart that, that Lot's wife had. That's the, the heart that looks back to those other things. He says, if we've got that, encourage one another to depart from that. Exhort one another daily so that you aren't hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ. He's reminding us if we are Christ, we've partaken of him. Don't go back that old way. If we hold on to what? Our confidence and our confession. And if we do what it says there, be steadfast to the end. See, part of not looking back is remaining steadfast in what you know is right and true and holding on to that. If you're not steadfast, if you're on shaky ground, if you're unsure, then that's where you begin to look back and you try to find another way, another situation, an old way that that helped you at one time. But if you remain steadfast like he's challenging us here, we're confident in who Christ is and what he's going to do in our life and where he's taking us. Then I move on to chapter four. And here in this chapter, around verse 14, he reminds us that Christ was a great high priest. That's a big part of Hebrews. Christ is the high priest, the highest of high priests. The high priest was the one that would be on behalf of the people and go into the Holy of Holies and sprinkle and and burn incense on behalf of the people. And that's what Jesus did. He gave his blood. He was the great high priest paying atonement for our sins. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it reminds us that he is the great great high priest, Jesus. He has passed through the heavens. He's the son of God. And we should, again, he uses the same phrase, hold fast to our confession. It means don't waver. It means focus on what what we know is right. It means don't look back at those other things. Now, here's what I want you to see about our great high priest. He can sympathize with our weakness. We forget that, I think. We forget that Jesus, because he is God in the flesh when he was on the earth, when he was here, we forget that he was tempted just like us, that he went through temptation. He was, in all points, the scripture says, tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we we need to remember to look at him when we're tempted to look back and go to those old ways and go to those simple things and go to those desires that we're challenged uh, or uh, tempted to go to. We need to look and remember that Jesus conquered all those things. He was in all points tempted, but without sin. And so it tells us, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace that will help us. In time of need. That's why it's so important that we can have someone that can help us be accountable. Someone that can be a prayer partner. Have someone that we can go to at the same time. And and in a sense run to. And if there's nobody, there's always who? Jesus. There's always the Lord. He's always there for us. If we'll just go to him and pray to him. That will help us and keep us from looking back. Look to him. Don't. Look back. You know, there's a story where Jesus himself encountered a young man. This passage, the story that he was talking about was around uh, Luke chapter 9. And he was talking several places about what it costs to be a disciple of Jesus. And he talks about a a person and, and following him down the road and what it's like to follow the Lord. And, and, you know, foxes, he says, don't have uh, places. The birds of the air have nests. Foxes have holes to sleep in. But there's nowhere even the Son of Man has. He says, but follow me. He went to one man and he gave an excuse. Let me go home and, and wait until my father dies. And then I bury my father. Then I'll follow you. And Jesus said, you know, I come first even before family. Let the dead bury the dead. But he comes to this one man. This is the one I want you to really focus on seeing. And he says, as I come to this man, this man came and said, this is verse 61. He says, I will follow you, Jesus. 
Can you imagine that? How many of us have said that? I'll follow you, Jesus. But <laughs> let me first go home and tell all of my family goodbye who are at my house. Seems like a reasonable request, right? I'm ready to follow you, but let me go at least tell my family goodbye, pack my bags, you know, get my belongings. I think it's much like the situation with Lot's wife. God always knows our hearts. He knows if our desire is really to follow him or our desire is to do something else. If we're putting excuses, excuses, sometimes every day. So Jesus said to him, knowing that if he went home, that he would stay there and not come back, not really follow him. He said, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Why don't you imagine what that's like? Imagine holding on to a plow and going forward. Where do your eyes have to be, right? Forward. It's pretty simple. You got to watch the animal that's pulling it in front of you. You've got to watch the plow to make sure it's going the right direction. You hear stories of men years ago who would look way down the, the line and find a tree or a fence post or something. And they would focus on that and keep their eyes in front of them so that the row would remain straight. Because they know if they've begun to look back, then all of a sudden the rows can come out. When you're going forward, driving forward, you got to be careful, right? Because if you look back and you don't keep focus on some of the stuff that's here, then you could have a train wreck, right? Today, that happened to me. I'm at Sam's trying to get some stuff and, and I was dropping in there on my way to get some stuff from the church. And this weekend, we're having some projects. And thank you to some of you that are helping out with those projects. But I pull in to get a car wash, right? <laughs> Wanted to get a little spruced up. And as I pull in, it was blocked. And there was a lady in front of it, so I didn't know it was blocked. And so when I got behind her, then I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't cross this way, which is the way you're supposed to go. You're not supposed to go against the grain, against the traffic. But I was stuck, and I couldn't really back up. And so I thought, I'll just pull in here to the right for one second. So that I can kind of back up and get out of there. And as soon as I pull in there, there comes a Jeep. And I stop my truck. And I thought, surely he sees I'm trying to back up. I'm in, in the way. And so I look back and start backing up. And I look at my camera, backing up, backing up. And all of a sudden I hear this horn honk. And I stop and I look. And that Jeep had pulled up within about six or seven inches of me. And if I'd have kept backing up with my wheel turned, I would have ran right into that Jeep. And I looked at him. I'm like, what? You know, like, why are you here? I shook, shook my head. And he's like, you're going the wrong way. And I was like, I know. That's why I'm trying to back up. I, I couldn't go anywhere else because that car was in front of me. I had no choice to either. But looking back for almost one second almost cost an accident. And I think that's a principle that we need to take to heart in our own life that if not for God, if not for a honking horn, and I believe God saving me that, that one moment, I would have had to fill out a lot of forms this afternoon that I would not have enjoyed filling out. I thought this was really good that a writer writes about, uh, kind of sums up what's happening. And it's, it's something written by C.S. Lewis in a book that he calls The Great Divorce. He has all these groups of people who are on a day trip and they go from hell to the borders of heaven. Hell is like a gray shadowy place and there are ordinary things and bus stops and fish chip shops and all these things. But ultimately it's unreal. Heaven, on the other hand, is bright and sharp and real. It's an it is an uncomfortable place for the shadowy, unsubstantial people on their day trip. On their arrival, they are each faced with a choice of whether to stay in heaven. And so gradually, painfully, they will become real. Or they can return to the comfort shadow land. In each case, the decision boils down to a choice between retaining an idol and gradually becoming nothing more than a pale reflection of the idol itself, 
or allowing the idol to be killed and thus being set free to a new dimension of life. And as he writes this story, this allegory describes well the choice that we as humans are faced with. We can follow the true God along a real path, often and sometimes it is painful. But this path of life, if we decide it, will ultimately be what? As believers and Christians who put our faith in him, it ultimately becomes the way to eternal life. Or we can believe all these worldly things, these worldly idols. And when they tell us that we cannot live without them and we settle for these earthly things and these empty promises for the moment, we will receive ultimately disappointment. And I wonder how many of the painful experiences we encounter in life sometimes are God's challenges to us, just like the Egypt in our lives. The Egypt that is painful and these frowning providences, these things that are often get us to go to, but we can turn Not towards that. Don't turn back towards those things, but turn towards him. Keep our eyes on him and have our trust in understanding the goodness and the greatness of God. I'm giving you several examples tonight. And it's easy if we would learn from others. Learn from Lot's wife. Learn from the man that Jesus talked to in the plow. Focus on the great high priest who can help us in time of temptation, cry out to him and learn from the Israelites who constantly look back towards Egypt. Don't look back. I don't know what it is in your life tonight that seems to creep back up and wants to grab you and take you down that wrong path. But I would challenge you to keep your eyes on Jesus Pray to him, and in times of temptation, let him do exactly that. Relieve you from the old way and not looking back. Will you pray with me? Lord, we just want to come before you and ask that you'll help us to do exactly that. Keep our eyes on you and not look back. Because it takes just a moment, a split second sometimes, when we look back and it can become a wreck. But I'm thankful, Lord, at times when that does happen, if we're honest and we come to you, many times your mercy is amazing. Many times if we come to you before that happens, you relieve us from that temptation and you put us on that right path. And Lord, I'm so thankful that you give us a hope, an eternal hope in heaven, and that we can continue as we struggle in these human bodies with these human temptations we we know without a doubt that you give us the victory the victory is in you jesus our lord and it's in your name we pray amen don't look back look forward to jesus in your life thank you for being a part of our service tonight thank you for being online with us and we just want to ask you to keep us in prayer as several of our people be working this weekend in our community in small groups and uh, being light uh, in the community and doing things for for others god bless you and have a good evening